Hi Kelly, first of all, thank you very much for being here with us. I think your story is very inspirational and now with Hispanic Heritage Month it's very useful to hear about your experience, right? So, so, so why, why don't we start with listening about your story? How did this girl who was born in Venezuela grow up to be a president and co-founder of that game company have your own games, change all these paradigms, right? About how the video game industry thinks about games, potentially putting a, a little bit of art in it, and how you ended up here. Can you walk us through your story and understand what was the key inspiration that you had? How were you thinking about when you did the different maneuvers, especially being at USC, doing yeah. an MFA, and then coming back into the video game industry? Yeah, I'll try and do the highlights, maybe. I'm sure we'll dig into points of it. Um, yeah. so, uh, yeah, I would, so my father, um, first is Cuban. Um, he left it with his family in 1960, um, as many did. And, um, and in, while he was in the United States, met my mother, they were in Virginia. Um, he worked in, um, software engineering and uh also the um did a lot of management in the business side of it and so he would often work with the um Latin American arms of various um software and technology companies and um that's how my family ended up in Venezuela for a few years during which I was born um we then went shortly at, thereafter came back to Virginia um I grew up in Richmond Virginia and um didn't know really any other, I think, Latino. I was trying to think. I don't know that there were any other Latinos at my school. Um, I, I definitely grew up in a pretty traditional suburban uh, American neighborhood, um, right in the middle between like the rich city of Richmond and the farms outside. And um, it's a place where a lot of people, uh, you, not a lot of people leave Virginia to go to college, but for some reason, um, I had it in my mind that I was going to leave as soon as I graduated from high school. And I really focused on going to New York. That's where I wanted to go. And, um, so while I was in high school, I mean, I'd been developing my whole life, but really gravitated towards the arts and, um, all mediums of art. Uh, but in high school, I think it started really focusing around performing arts. And so I applied to the New York University Tisch School of the Arts for Theater, um, and that was sort of my ticket out of Virginia. Um, and I know, looking back, I think some of that had to do with just being an outsider from the very beginning. Um, my husband and I talk a lot about it because he's from Toronto and uh, loves Toronto and grew up there and like feels a lot of affinity there. And how is it that you grow up in a place and yet like you don't feel like you're really from there? So then in New York, um, I really gra started gravitating towards original works, um, which more and more um, started incorporating interactive media and digital media into the performances. And so I kind of would become the de facto person in charge of that stuff because I was in the arts, but then I also um, was very comfortable with computers because we always had one at my house and my dad worked in that business. and. Um, it was just nothing, it was something that was never taboo or that I was discouraged from. So, um, a couple years after graduating from NYU, I decided to kind of, oh, maybe I'll like focus on that, um, really become specialized in interactive media and performance. And that's what brought me to the University of Southern California and their MFA and in interactive media program. Um, so then like this other through line through all that is like video games and playing video games. Um, but, uh, it's like another place for outsiders, I guess. <laughs> and like also, um, uh, a space in which, you know, all through college, like I was in college, right. at sort of the height of like golden eye, like that's what you did with people. But that was, that was kind of the first time also it was like all guys and like none of my girlfriends did it. And that was really interesting and weird. And that continued after school. But, um, so it was something that I, enjoyed it was part of my life um but never thought about who made a video game or how they went about it or that it was something like that i would do and then my first year at usc i had this course in um the history of play 
uh, taught by Tracy Fullerton, who now chairs the program. And it looked at um, the history of game design, not only within the context of digital video games, but throughout human history and sort of the place of and the role of play and game design in culture. And that really, I think, that really opened my eyes up to game design as a medium through which you would communicate. Um, that coupled with then the, gen the school's general philosophy of rapid iteration and prototyping and really you know, the program is housed within the School of Cinematic Arts, so it really took this storytelling focus on it. And um, I'm sorry, I feel like this like keeps angling up. Is it mm -hmm. like, okay? You can hear okay, right? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, thinking about it as a communicative medium, and instead of starting with this sort of bullet point list of we're making this kind of game, you know, we're going to make an RPG. That means it has this kind of mechanics and it's going to be set in this world. And our twist is like, you're a girl or whatever that is. It was really starting with what's a story that you want to tell. And now let's use this process of rapid iteration and prototyping to discover game mechanics that elicit that. Um, and, uh, and yeah. And so I just started dedicating everything to that. It kind of, I realized it was sort of the medium I had been looking for all along. It was really a combination of those interests in science and technology, as well as the arts and communication, and also anthropology and psychology. And the people in it um, were and are of that like-mindedness. So really, kind of for the first time when I went to my first game developers conference that same year, um, it was kind of like a one-two punch in sort of like getting me on board with game design. So having my eyes open to kind of game design in, as a medium and then going to the game developers conference and feeling like I was a part of this tribe, um, that uh, these were my people and, um, and that really energized me. And so I just started trying to work on as many game projects as possible. And that's what led me to collaborating with um, my fellow student, Genova Chin, on a student project called Cloud. Okay. Is this good? <laughs> We're like yeah. getting up to, <laughs> okay, <laughs> not too much, not too little, hopefully. Uh, so Cloud, it's funny to think about on now, because for us, it was really a, an experiment in thinking, could we take the, this philosophy of, of our program um, this viewpoint of really games as storytelling, use that to communicate a story that was not typically told in mass commercially accepted video games, but make something that would appeal to an equally, if not broader audience. The idea being that we were growing up and maturing and there weren't games there for us anymore that uh, games with deep story also required so much time that we didn't have. And the, the converse of that was really casual, shallow games. Um, and so could we create games that both, um, deeply resonated with people, um, but also recognize like constraints around time and money? And, uh, and Cloud was this game in which you played as a boy who was trapped in the hospital and daydreamed he could fly through the clouds. And the idea was to elicit this feeling like you were a kid daydreaming and looking at the sky. And, um, and we, I think it was like, there was another school that had this story of how their game for another festival had been downloaded like a thousand times or something like that. And we're like, oh, if we could do that. Because you really just like put them on line and people downloaded them to judge them for festivals or probably not. Usually we like sent the, we would send CD-ROMs. That's how you did it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, but we made the website. So like, oh, if someone happens to check it out at one of these festivals, they can then go play it themselves. That would be awesome. And then within three months, we had over 300,000 downloads from all over the world. Um, it was extremely organic, extremely viral. 
Um, and it made us feel like we were really onto something, um, that this was something that people wanted. So we, the cloud was created under this grant that, um, EA had support, uh, um, had provided the school. And so as part of that grant project, um, we were to pitch to EA as though we were going to create cloud, make cloud into like a full console title. Um, but as a result of this exercise, Genova and I had this full pitch deck about what it would look like if we created a company and we had done all this thinking about it and we got a lot of feedback from EA that was extremely useful. And one of the points of uh, feedback that we got was, Hey, you know, there's kind of this new thing called digital distribution and, uh, those games can be smaller. You don't have to make these multi-million dollar projects anymore. And, uh, and, you know, that that would be a barrier for you guys because you don't have any experience in the industry. So maybe if you scale this down, think about making a small version that could be digitally distributed at a smaller price point, that would be more acceptable. And sure, and that's what we did. And then sure enough, Sony was really into that idea because, you know, unbeknownst to the world at that point, they were planning on PlayStation Network um, the next year. And... uh and they also had an idea about using digital distribution to create high quality, unique content um, that wouldn't get made otherwise and uh, to take advantage of these like smaller price points and um, and a willingness to have shorter experiences than you would when you buy a $50, $60 disc title. Um, so we joined forces with them in a three game deal to develop three titles for PlayStation Network. And we did with um, Flow, Flower, and then Journey was our last one. Um, under this umbrella of that game company, um, the mission of that game company was to create experiences that would push the boundaries of video games as a communicative medium. So every game that we did, we started with a point of, I mean, first of all, really, like, what's something that hasn't been done in games before? Um, but also, like, what are we motivated to talk about and say? And then going on sort of a long journey ourselves to figure out, okay, what's the game that really captures that feeling? Um, and, and I mean, one of the things I'm probably the most proud about, proud of with all three games is I think like no matter when it is, I'm looking at them. And if I look at any of them like today, um, they're all still super weird <laughs> to mm -hmm. me, like in the way that like I can't believe we got away with making that on a major console. Um, and that then like lots of people played it and were really into those titles. I think, um, it's still, um, yeah, it's, I, I'm very proud that we took that opportunity that we had to go out on a limb and that we just really did that. Um, and we kind of said like, well, you know, whether it's successful or not, we're at least going to really try this out. Um, and I feel like we did that on every, every project. <clears throat> wow. And that that's extremely interesting. Thanks for sharing your story, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and the thing that stands out the most to me is how you were talking about you got to this place thanks to a, a, a perfect combination of several factors, right? You, you had a passion for media. You had a hobby for, for video games. Mm -hmm. You have the family influence for systems and computers. You have the, the school influence, right, with history of gaming. And then you started going and pivoting from this place where you felt like a stranger to this place to where you felt like you belonged. And you, you started finding this this community and that became very powerful for you. And I think that working with that community allowed you to, to explore outside your, your comfort zone and started thinking about <coughs> video games as art, as communicating a storyline mm -hmm. through video games. And I think that's really powerful. And it comes thanks to all that background that allowed you to go out there and, and explore that. Can you tell us how that specific mindset started of video games as art? Because many people here, <clears> right, we, we don't generally think of video games as art. Once you start understanding why, then, then it starts making sense. Can you walk us through why do you consider video games art and how did you start with this idea? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I th think fundamentally it comes down to like, where did you play video games when you were growing up? Yes. 
What was the game that you really oh, I played? They played it. They GoldenEye, <coughs> Mario Kart, that, yeah. that, that Smash Brothers. <laughs> so I'm not a big gamer, but I did spend a few hundred hours in many <laughs> of those games. Yeah, so maybe some of it is sort of <laughs> trying to validate that time spent. Um, I think there is an element where anyone who, I like to think anyone who's making that argument, including myself, it's because there has been, there has been at least one game that's impacted you in a way that any other medium would. So it's hard to, to negate that or like divide, put a divide somehow between the experience I had, um, with like, uh, I'm trying to think of any of them. I mean, even like, um, Zelda 64, um, and the emotional journey of that story. Um, I know other, a lot of other people my age, um, it's like Final Fantasy 7, which is a hero's journey, right? And, um, and the impact that had on them and their psyche and, it's just feels similar to other art forms. So, so we, we say that, um, but the other component of it is then really, I think formalizing the, the vocabulary and ideas around that when I was at, at grad school, um, and within the game developer community as a whole. I mean, I think there's, that's a large thrust of the work that, that we do as a community is really understanding what, is codifying and trying to put vocabulary around this. Um, that professor Tracy Fullerton was, was part of, um, a whole academic movement, um, which is really captured in her book, a uh, game design workshop, um, which is based on this idea that I think coming from a time when there was this idea that sort of game designers were just wizards and you kind of did, you could do it or you couldn't do it. You were either good at it or not good at it. But there was like a whole other um, subculture saying, well, we think that we can put some some structure around this and put some ideas to this that we could teach anyone how to do it. Um, but you can at least make someone a good designer um, and maybe make a good designer a great designer through these um, through this process. Uh, so. I think that was um, hugely formative um, and really solidifying for me the idea that this is that games are have the potential to be artistic. I don't think all games are artistic, but I don't think all television is art or all films are art. Um, but is it capable of that? Yes, it's definitely capable of that. It is a there's a vocabulary, there is a language. Um, you can use it to speak to other people through it. That's great. And so, so when I think about video games as art, I think that there can be many different components of it, right? Like one can be the graphics part, that I can see graphics be, being art. You can think about the music, the music within mm -hmm. a video game being art. But you're referring specifically to the storytelling, to, to like how you connect with other audiences. And the example that you bring is Zelda. Um, it has a storytelling to it, but it's a very complicated story, right? <laughs> so, so when you compare it against cloud about this kid who, who, who just dreams about going through the clouds or, or a video game where you're just the wind, right? Mm -hmm. And you're, you're going through, through the mountains. It's a very different story. And you, you mentioned it even now. I'm surprised that, that so many people got into it. Mm -hmm. What do you think made so many people get into it? Like, like it's definitely art, but Art is not always appreciated right away. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't become as viral as your games have become. Mm -hmm. What do you think made your game special as opposed to other games who might be trying storytelling in this novel way mm -hmm. but didn't succeed as you did? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of games require a lot of players in order to get something, to get that story out of it. Um, and we really tried, I mean, accessibility as a whole was really important to us. Um, it cont continues to be important to all of us. Um, and so how could we remove, remove barriers? Um, how could we create experiences that really invited people into them as opposed to punishing them for not doing the things we want them to do? Um, so not requiring a lot of time in order to even grasp the story. Um, I think is a barrier that 
that we can we removed there. Um, controls cloud actually had really kind of weird controls because we were trying to make ones that were more accessible than your average PC game. Um, we failed at it on cloud. It was something that we uh, took into our work on PlayStation and iterated over time and every project in trying to really remove those barriers. Um, I mean, I like I have many friends who pick up the controller in well any of our games uh and they like almost are sweating like oh my god what am i supposed to do it's like it's okay like nothing's going to happen to you just fig you can figure it out it's all right you have time and and there's nothing coming out after you um so so yeah trying to think about um not just like making a game easier like that difficulty is a barrier but that there are actually these sort of other um these other barriers that almost are psychological to many people when they approach a video game. Great. And so, so just building on that, when, when you're thinking about launching a, a new game, right, and you, you want to adjust the, the difficulty, the controls, the every single aspect of, of the game, how do you think about it when it's such a new way of, of doing gaming, right? Because you can't really compare the controls against a I don't know, a yeah. fighting game or something like that. And even how people think about it and get, get engaged, it also varies. So how did you do it? Did you start with your small community and then build up from there? And if so, were you concerned or, or how did you tackle the obstacles that the market might be different than the small group designing this game? Yeah, um, playtesting is really, really critical. And for us, we would do it every two weeks from the very beginning of a project um, because we would start with this very vague like idea. Um, uh, like with Journey, it was like make an online multiplayer console game that left you with a renewed sense of faith in humanity, right? So it's like there's a lot that could fall under that. And so you just start really like throwing things um at the wall and it's very painful i think it's like one of the biggest mistakes game designers make i think is just not doing that and it's like something that everyone talks about but uh but it's hard to watch people play like this thing that is ugly and not you know isn't good but um but it's so useful to get that feedback on it and yeah i i would always start with um what's called friends and family play tests right mm -hmm. um and bring in uh even more than just like friends and families, but like limited to like close advisors who are also usually game developers who I found were very articulate. So they could hear what's our, what is that goal? And then how is our experience aligning with that goal or not? Mm -hmm. um, then maybe opening it up to friends and family and then opening it up to a broad pool. I mean, doing very traditional like user testing, focus testing style. Um, sessions with our games. Um, but at the end, I always felt like, I mean, especially with Journey and being an online game, um, you know, without, we didn't do um, an online beta, really. Like, we did one limited. Um, but so we didn't know how many people were always going to be on together, for instance. Um, those kind of questions uh, we kind of had to launch with, um, with them being unanswered. And for me, it was like, did we do I think that we made the game that articulated the original goals we set out to do? Yes. Okay. Then, then I think it's a success and then sort of everything else happens outside of me because I can't control it. Wow. And, and that, in that very specific case for, for journey, it sounds like there were a lot of things that you did different, maybe based on, on the experience that you had before. So can you talk a little bit about how, on, on whether you think, that was part of the success of Journey. So when you compare it against Flow, Flower, or even Cloud, right? Mm -hmm. Journey was a lot more successful, but it sounds that it's the one where you didn't do the beta, you didn't do a lot of testing, that you just decided to go for the storytelling and, and answer mm -hmm. the question, am I creating the product that I want to create? Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's what generated the success of Journey? And if so, if you were going to launch another game, is that what you would do again? Well, we still did a lot of testing with Journey. We just didn't do a like full online uh, test with it. But um, uh, 
I, I don't know. It's whenever there's something that's really successful, it's like really easy to go back and think you're reverse engineering it. Um, I do think there's an element like in Journey, it is first of all, it's the hero's journey sh- structure. Um, that came from again this idea of creating games that would resonate with a wide group of people and then saying oh here's joseph campbell and all this research on hero's journey that's a story that has resonated with a wide group of people over thousands of years like what if we took it into a video game um but then also you were playing as this you know avatar which you weren't in our previous games really um the sort of human-like uh being I think that possibly resonated more with the core PlayStation audience, at least at that time. Um, So, yeah, I mean, there was always a part of our process that was understanding who our core audience was, um, which I think is really helpful and not something many people maybe pick up on as far as what we were doing or or like what I think is still really critical, which is there is the story you want to tell. Um, but having impact is this process of thinking of like, who is your initial core audience and kind of radiating out from there. And because we had an exclusive deal with Sony, we knew our audience was going to be this PlayStation 3 audience that fundamentally was who we were locked to at launch and how, if we don't resonate with them, like it's not going to have that ripple effect outward. So, um, so we want, we deliberately made choices around, you know, what it would look like. And of course, Sony having um, some input on that as far as uh, their goals um, for what looks like and feels like a polished PlayStation experience. Okay. Did they have a lot of influence in, in the game? Then? Were they actively involved in that one? So so in, for the most part, no. They're very hands-off um, as a studio with their external developers. Um, but there was, um, I think the positive influence of it is like, is that we all were kind of kids at, straight out of school and we had no experience doing commercial games. And they really pushed us in um, understanding what it meant to make a high quality console title, um, which is very different than making a student project. <laughs> like there are a lot of growing pains along that. Um, uh, yeah, growing pains is probably the best way to describe it. Okay. <laughs> So, so it sounds like you as a group learned a lot from, from that experience. And, and thinking about the group, I would like to go back to something that you said earlier about how at the beginning you were feeling like, a, like an outsider. Mm-hmm. And then there was a point where, where you felt like you belong. Um, thinking about the, the, the framing of all this stuff, right? It's, we're doing this as part of Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and I would like to ask you, how do you find that community? Like, like being a, a Hispanic woman in the video game industry, how did you navigate that? Were there any obstacles that you needed to to tackle that you want to highlight? And and if so, after that, how did you build that community that you felt like you belong? Because I think it's very important for everybody here to understand how do you find that place, that community, where you feel like you belong? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's huge. Um, So I... You know, I don't know anyone else's experience but my own, I guess is the first (laughs) thing. Um, I think feeling like an outsider from early on has helped me in giving me a certain um, naivety around what's acceptable for me to say and do or not. Um, at the same time, I think it's all, it also made me feel from early on that, that there was maybe a, um, even if it wasn't literal, but kind of a language barrier to me and other groups of people. Like I could figure out how to plug myself in if I could figure out the right way to say the thing I needed to say to this group of people. Um, which has helped in public speaking and like Mm -hmm. teaching and stuff, you know, it's it's a good way to think about it. And, and, um, dialogues cross culture is, is really helpful. Um, but at the same time going into, uh, games there, there was a lot of, um, I think 
doubts around, I perceived a lot of doubts around my presence in that space. Um, whether it was, uh, like, doubts about my validity as a woman like oh i'm here because i'm the girl or i'm here because i'm cute or whatever um that sense and that that sort of idea of being around me was something that it was a really huge turning point for me actually um being getting to join the ted fellows network and being a part of a community where actually a lot of them are in similar positions are kind of like a lot of outsiders in their fields um and getting advice back to me about really um kind of at a certain point taking feedback is good but you also need to come come at it with uh a core um grounding that um, that had kind of gotten worn down for me. And it's def it definitely opened me up to um, a greater sense of understanding and empathy for, um, for all minorities in whatever field. Um, because I think that that's sort of an issue that, um, that affects us all, is sort of having a constant, like, you're not really supposed to be here. Um, you're only here because of, this um your you know whatever that is so um really being regrounded and saying like almost that what is that um joke around uh I like affirmation style right <laughs> of like you're good and people like you or whatever <laughs> but um but really like for a while like kind of having to feel that within myself like this is what i'm bringing this is where i'm coming from and this is valuable on its own this is not just valuable like in a certain context in a certain place but this is valuable and i think that's also allowed me to be in a better place to accept feedback and i've l grown and evolved like much quicker but for a while it was this downward like trend that i could have seen on another path like stalling out and i think that's what happens to many of us of course um, you just kind of say like i i'm tired of that yeah. you know and i'm not going to do it anymore and that's... yeah and, it, and it's <laughs> difficult for many of us right the, the 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 stereotypes the obstacles that one needs to 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 just jump in order to to get to where we are thank you for for sharing that part that was extremely powerful and i think it, it, it's very inspiring for for the audience here um how do you think you're going to, or you are translating that, all that experience, everything that you learned in the video game industry into Google, especially thinking about how to open it up, how to, to bring more people into the community, right? How to make it more inclusive? Yeah, well, so right now I'm working as a publishing producer on um, the Daydream team, right? And so really, and it's, a, it's kind of all new virtual reality, augmented reality. How are you going to operate in that space? also publishing games and like building out an ecosystem. And it feels like um, yet another moment to set a new precedent and set a new tone, um, which is something I think we're always hoping to do in uh, whatever we're doing at Google, because it's such a, um, uh, they provide that kind of opportunity and outlook towards the world and what you do. Um, so, I mean, in preparation for this talk, I was thinking a lot about this and, uh, and that I think games are, what I love about them within tech is that they're really, they are really inclusive space. They're a great way. I mean, um, they're like huge development communities now in Brazil and Argentina, Argentina, Mexico, um, and Puerto Rico, uh, um, and then growing scenes and other, and it's a, so it's a great way for people to come in and get skills and technology that I think, um, that I think have a lower barrier than other sectors of tech. Um, and games themselves are this space in which you are invited to drop your identity, assume another, um, pretend to be someone else to play out the world that you want as opposed to the one that you're in um 
gaming culture is a whole other thing. And that's been a big subject the last few years. And I think that we can kind of separate those out like games and from the gaming culture. Mm -hmm. Um, and here's an opportunity with a new platform, a new ecosystem to maybe make a positive con contribution in sort of setting a new tone for new culture. Um, another way it's really impacted me is I'm involved at like <laughs> we're a growing team. And, um, and so I've been thrust in like, this is just now at my first year at Google, but I think I've been thrust in really fast to the interviewing process, right? And learning about how it's done here and, um, and thinking a lot about, um, what are ways in which, you know, I know we're, we're always trying to remove that bias. Um, but what are ways in which it's still present? You know, are there ways in which our questions around like, logical thinking kind of bias towards a specific person that's come from a specific privileged background. Um, I'm not saying that it is, it's just like something I think about a lot and I'm, and I am shaping the questions that we ask other people. Um, so I'm really trying at every step to, to ask those questions. And, and it's great to be in a community actually of um, other Googlers that, you know, you don't, that they accept those questions very, um, genuinely, right? Of course. And that's great. And uh, and I think it, it does work at the two levels that you describe, right? First is, how do you form a team here that, that works against those unconscious bias? How, how can you form all these perceptions that allow you to bring your full self to work? Mm -hmm. But then there's also how, how as platform creators, how can you impact the, the, the gaming culture, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think that one is even more powerful because I think that's where the, the vast majority of the problems are. Do you have any initial thoughts about how you're thinking about that? How do you think you can positively impact the gaming culture via the platform creation? Yes, it's a tricky spot that Google operates in, right? Which is, um, I think as we're all familiar uh, with, which is, is setting up tools and structures to be open um, and for everyone, um, while at the same time wanting to present a certain perspective right and um and with daydream publishing we're like really on the edge of that because publishing isn't an operation google typically does google builds the platform and then people make the stuff for the platform and with publishing you're going out and um with whatever resources it is even if it's just a hey we're going to be really hands-on with you and like give you advice and consultation from our internal partners like that's um the projects you choose to do with that put a perspective out there in the world and so um i don't know if i can say too much more than that other than it's like we're constantly thinking about it and wanting to um wanting to well i guess like at google everything you try to think about things at scale but we also like try to think about the tone we're setting at scale. Like, what does it mean to pick this project over this one? Yeah. That's <clears throat> that's great. I mean, the, the initial thoughts are, are, are more than useful, right? It's about how you think about the the developers. Where are you sourcing ideas? Where are you sourcing products? Yes. What are you supporting? And then which kind of ideas they are promoting within the platform, right? So, right. So, so thanks. Let me make sure that we can open it up to, to, to questions from the audience be, before we finalize, because I'm pretty sure there's a few questions that, that people really <laughs> want to, to ask. So I want to yeah. give them a chance first. Do we have a microphone, by the way? Or, oh, yes, Elizabeth has one. Yep. Hello. Hey. Is it on? I don't think it's on. Right, try is again. the microphone working? Yes. Yeah. It is okay. not working, yes. Um, so I wrote down a few questions, but I'll just ask one. Oh, cool. Uh, <laughs> one is um, something that I thought of while you were talking about storytelling is I feel like text adventures are a huge place where innovation has happened, mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of like an old thing. And I was wondering if it's something that you've looked into or drawn inspiration from. 
Oh, definitely. I mean, it's been huge in, um, especially drawing in, um, and, in and empowering um, the transgender community in game development. They it's like a lot of um, the Twine community is really, um, yeah, empowered that in such an awesome way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think about how can we build on that? Is it just, is it just time? Like, is it, is it okay that tool is there now and then it's just kind of waiting for people to build up the skill sets are or are they are those voices getting lost at a certain point um you know that's like to me it's like what's the what's the next step from there because it's definitely providing a lot of opportunity for a lot of people that didn't have it before yeah and how can i like enable those experiences in other mediums that i'm working on for sure because <laughs> some of those yeah they're really great i also really appreciate the up to the trans oh sure <laughs> um so i'm kind of curious like what makes you decide to leave that game company and uh, what makes you think kind of like why you pick <laughs> vr as the new direction you are going to like pursue after and uh, do you think VR is a better platform about that gaming story, like art, mm. like this kind of like thing? Like, yeah. So, um, so so part part of the answer to that game company is kind of easy, which is um, it was six years together, and it's kind of like having a company together is like a long term relationship, and at that point, you're like either you're growing together, like you're you've all you're all growing and changing over six years. Like you're either growing together or you're growing apart. And we were, we just recognized that we were growing apart and sort of what we wanted to do next. Um, and why, why like try and really it felt like kind of putting the, the round peg in the square hole or vice versa of, um, uh, of, of being together and like constraining ourselves. So instead, like let's separate and like really unchain ourselves and feel free to pursue exactly what it is we wanted to be doing. Um, one of the things was originally with that game company, the idea Genova and I had was to build an umbrella under which like many studios could operate, but that's not how that game company evolved um, for good reasons. Um, and I still wanted to, I still, I still wanted to sort of multiply, put a multiplier effect on this impact. Um, and that's part of also what led me to Ouya the Android based console where I was head of developer relations and content acquisition. And, um, and it was like the pendulum swinging all the other way, the entire the way where like at that game company, you know, the journey was the last project had been three years, one game at a time. Um, and Ouya was working on like 500 games at a time. Uh, and now I'm like somewhere in the middle. Um, so it, I got exactly what I needed out of that, um, and continued to do so at Google and interacting with the, the wide range of studios and really getting to see what, why things are the way they are today. Um, how do we get to the places of like making this certain type of game or this certain type of product and a certain type of platform? Um, as far as why VR and AR, it's because it's, it, part of it's because it's new. It's, it's, um, yet again, the industry is at this place where there's this budding new medium and there's very few rules and definition around it. So here's a time where we get to play and figure out those rules for ourselves. Yeah. Hey. Um, so, you with each of the games, um, the that game company the games, you had a specific goal of like the kind of experience you wanted to evoke. Um, but a secondary goal of almost all games is to make it just a fun experience, right? And so I was one, and it definitely succeeded on that front as well. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if there are times when you have to make compromises between. The story that you want to tell, the feeling you want to evoke, and um, things that make a game fun. Or if there's mm -hmm. any like tension there, or if it just flows naturally. Or... So for me, I think um, like another word for fun is engaging, and I think games do well, with some exception. Like there are games intentionally not fun or intentionally not engaging, right? But um, when we're talking about once when your goal is commercially yeah commercial success i think engaging is core to that you want 
you want people to gravitate towards it, to to play it, to not drop it, and like to get to the end. And so um, to me, it doesn't feel like compromising so much as I think it's just like one of the goals you have to hit as the project. Um, probably the thing that compromises, that feels like the most compromise is time and resources. Um, so just like having to say, you know, this doesn't feel like the best solution, but we have to move on. Yeah. Um, everyone in games, there's the phrase like, you don't, you don't finish a game, you abandon it. That's kind of like how it always feels, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> You want another question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the microphone just comes to the whole area. Um, I was wondering if you had any recommendations for like really good storytelling games that you'd like to share. Oh man. Mm -hmm. Um what's <laughs> like a go Yo, that would be good. <laughs> Make a go link. Kelly's favorite storytelling games. Um Probably uh, two of the ones um, in recent history would be the uh, would be Papers Please and um, uh, oh my gosh another one <laughs> but, but Papers Please yeah is one of them um, it because it really tells its story through it's one of those that tells the story through every aspect of the game like the visuals the music. The, the narrative itself and then also the mechanics like all place you in this situation by which you were you're kind of getting receiving the story through all those elements um and uh yeah it does it in a really fantastic way thank you um do you want another I one, I one. <laughs> I I one more. yeah I guess uh, one of my other questions is uh, how do you deal with, I know the, the internet, like the dark underbelly of the internet can be really toxic, especially to femme game designers. Like, mm -hmm. um, how have you dealt with a lot of like vitriol from the internet and how do you deal with it? And, um, so I have not, um, I will say I'm not the most outspoken social person on social media. Um, and I think about that a lot. Like, am I doing that? It, am I not outspoken because I don't want to deal with that? Um, is that a reason to be outspoken, not be outspoken or, or vice versa? Uh, or is it that I'm also burnt on like, all social media platforms being designed to sell you stuff right now. And I, and it, that it's just really toxic in and of itself. Um, that's a whole other fireside chat maybe, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, I am being tracked somewhere as for like my activities in the games industry. Cause there's a whole idea around the like social justice warrior mafia, which I love that that's an insult of a name because I think social justice warrior sounds amazing. <laughs> I would love that. But, um, but yeah, I, so I haven't experienced certainly many people very close to me have it. And that's what, um, that's what I was thinking about when I was thinking about the separation between games and gaming culture. Um, it was like specifically my professor Tracy Fullerton very recently went through this and now she's like just not on Twitter and she's not on Facebook. She's just like ghosted herself from social media. Um, and I don't know, like that's a loss, but like also, but it's not like she's still doing her work. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know how to, how we like extract these things from each other, right? Yes. Hey, so um, I was curious when you, well, first I wanted to say that uh, when I was a little kid, uh, Sierra Online was put out King's Quest and King's yeah. Quest, one of the two creators of that was Roberta Williams. Right. So it actually never occurred to me until recently that women weren't actually a part of the game. Right. So, yeah, right. She was all, those were all my favorite games. 
So, but what I wanted to ask was, uh, Sony gave you this time in order to develop this game. How much freedom did they give you to just kind of explore your own thing mm-hmm. versus kind of rein you in and try to make a commercially viable product? So each game that we did was more expensive. So on Journey, it was really interesting um, and educational for me because we hit a budget point where suddenly a lot more people were focused on the game. Um, Again, their position sort of towards third party in general was pretty hands off. So I think we were probably shielded from quite a lot of it. Um, But yeah, it before that we were sort of operating at a budget um which is a smart thing to do like when you're creating content that's sort of weird and different or um at least different from mainstream or what's been done in the past uh keeping your budget low is like a good way to just like kind of float under the radar um because it won't require that many approvals and like not that many people have to look at it to like get paid uh so yeah, so it was very educational in that way. And then, but then getting to Journey, it was sort of more, it got to see more of the like, oh, we really need, because now we need to charge a certain price for it. So, like, really needs to like have these things. Now, by that point, it was our third game. So, our egos had been like pretty high and like <laughs> that shielded us for better or for worse. Like, we just didn't accept a lot. But, um, yeah. Hi, so I really liked when you were talking about um, games being potentially an easier route into tech for people from other backgrounds and also that you came from theater yourself originally. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you feel like there's not that many easy ways for people from like the arts to get into tech or it's been actually developing to be a little bit more more easily accessible or that it should be or do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, so I'm not, I'm not exposed to like every sector of tech. So there may be ones where it's like very, it's much more easier, much easier than others. Right. But, um, uh, for games, I think, I think fundamentally, like for a lot of technology companies, it's important to demonstrate work on technology. Um, so games now, there are so many tools, um, and, uh, web development as well. And, um, to, to learn how to code. Um, at the same time, the specific coding that you learn for games, that way of approaching it is, um, I find just a really useful practice in learning programming. Like you ha- understanding 3D space um, is like the best way to learn 3D math. Um, approaching it in games was very different than approaching it in just like a textbook. Um, so it's, I think it's that practice of doing and that you you can do it. And also the reward of like playing a game that you made with someone else is like a really great payoff. And so that creates its own, like in a way game loop and like state of flow through it. Um, so, so fundamentally you're just like practicing and getting that portfolio built out and that, or at least a body of work you can reference and take into an interview somewhere. Um, yeah, there's something else I want to say about it. I totally forgot. Mm-hmm. You were asking something else of like, yeah. is it is it easy it, enough for people to find those opportunities? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so the other part is, I think this is shifting now slowly, which is really exciting to see. But there are more. Well, there are definitely more sectors now applying game design to their work, like in politics, in health in science like they're looking here at google there have been more people from game industry hired in the last year than i think ever and that's we're seeing that at many other technology companies um so uh so at the same time like people with strict art backgrounds i feel like there's still this divide that i would like to keep bending us towards like having more um I don't know, creative directors and writers and like people that just have arts backgrounds like that that's very valuable and um and contribute something to all of our work Thanks. yeah yes um one just with the microphone please because oh. there's a live stream oh yeah Hi. um so for in one of the million pushbacks for oculus has been the lack of content um mm. How, like, in 
in a year in at Google, how, what are we doing to address it? And how long do you think it will take for good gaming content to show up on Daydream or just virtual reality platforms? Yeah, I mean, certainly Daydream Publishing is trying to um, speed things along uh, and and creating tools. I mean, there's also the like the googly approach. Yeah, creating like easy to use tools um, to make creating awesome experiences um, easier. The other part is the um, the lower cost of the hardware itself. Um, so it being based on smartphones, hopefully many people that subsidize through their carriers, like then the, the viewer and controller itself is being at a low price point. And so that will allow more people than, um, than other platforms to just have access because every, every phone is a development kit as well. Um, and so that'll just empower, a, a greater community. Um, to me, that's always what it comes down to is fundamentally like that cost. I mean, that's what we talk about. Even, um, that was something I learned in Ouya and being more exposed to the hardware side of things is like, it's really expensive to import things to most South American countries. So they don't have the, you know, they don't even have like the hardware to work on. Um, and, uh, and then that's true within, of course, po certain populations, um, in the United States as well. So the more we can do to lower that barrier to entry, the more we um, enable more types of people to express themselves. You're saying lower cost of hardware itself, not the cost of development or different completely different platforms. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the uh, base. So I want to make sure we do finish on time because people have, have meetings, but I do <laughs> want to, to thank you very much, Kelly, for, for sharing your story. I think your story is very powerful, very inspiring, especially for <laughs> Hispanic Heritage Month. It's full of finding your inspiration, sense of belonging, building communities, bringing a passion that you have into a new industry, and even changing paradigms, looking at video games as hard. So thank you very much for sharing it. Thank uh, you. Let's give a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. <laughs>